Well, as I announced last week, uh, the main reason that all of the Apostolic Council was with us this morning is that at some point in uh, the service here, we're going to have a commissioning and uh, of Sherry and I to serve you for the next 18 months as the interim senior pastor. And uh, yeah, well, thank you. I announced that last week and didn't realize what I was actually doing. And I said, that could have gone really bad. Um, but uh, anyway, thank, I, I just want to thank you for your support in that. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragement. It's just been incredible. And so we believe that Cornerstone Church of Augusta is still on a journey. And uh, sometimes we don't know how that journey is going to involve us as we go along. But what I do know is that if we choose Christ and Christ alone, whatever it is, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And so anyway, so uh, today I had asked Pastor Kenny West, one of our apostolic members and also an associate pastor at our church in Broadway, uh, to come and to share the Word of God with you. So would you welcome Pastor Kenny as he comes to share with us. Testing, testing. Can you hear me now? All right. Wow. Well, today is going to be a good day. Amen? It is going to be a good day. Well, it's always a pleasure for me to come here. I love coming here. I really do. I'm coming next week, too. I want to hear Pastor Brad. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Pastor Brad's anointed. So uh, God's doing some really good things within the HeartLink Network. God's really moving. Things are happening. Church plants. Uh, people being raised up. People being mentored. And, so, and we have some great leadership especially Pastor Greg. I'm telling you, he is an amazing leader, one who I have learned a great deal from, especially when it comes to loving people. And that is a challenge. <laughs> but Pastor Greg knows how to do it. He really does. I don't know too many men that do know how to do that. Very few that I've run into over the years that know how to actually love you and demonstrate that, not only just love you, but also their heart is to see you restored. Amen? So one thing I will say, and that is that you are in good hands because you have an, a couple, uh, Pastor Greg and Sherry, whose heart is to see restoration. That's where their heart is. Amen. All right. Maybe I'll get the preacher now. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and 3, reading from the New Living Translation, For everything there is a season and a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to harvest, a time to kill, and a time to heal. Several years ago, I went through a real crisis in my life. I mean, a serious, serious crisis. And one of the things that I began to question, because so much change was going on in my life, was whether the plan of God had changed for me. Somehow it had gotten into my head that because of what I was going through, that God's plan for my life had somehow changed. That suddenly God changed his mind. That what I felt he had called me to do, that I was not going to do. That plan had somehow gotten changed and just twisted around somehow. I was also very wounded. I was an emotional wreck. My pastor at the time, Pastor Tony D'Onofrio, who I did not discuss this with, we used to have services sometimes, and there were times when he would just move out in a service. He was very gifted with a word of knowledge, very strongly prophetic man. And I was really feeling kind of down, and I remember him calling me out in a service one day, and he said to me, he said, God's plan has not altered for you. He said, he's got the same plan he's always had for you. 
it has not changed. That he has the same plans that he has always had. And although it took some time and it took a little bit of a process for me to process that whole thing, I found that I could trust the Lord through those times. I continued to trust the Lord, found out that God was faithful, and he was faithful to really get me through that very, very dark time. He also healed me emotionally, inwardly. And I learned the scripture to be true. In Psalms 62 and verse 5, it says, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. So, Cornerstone Church of Augusta, my hope this morning is to encourage you, not to give you a rallying pep talk, you know, get you all worked up in the flesh, but to encourage you that through, through all of what you're walking through, that you will be encouraged. Keep your focus on the Lord. I don't want to get you worked up in the soul, in the flesh. What I would like to do is just inspire you to continue to trust your God because he is trustworthy and that nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing takes God by surprise. He knows what's going to happen down the road. He knew all along what was going to happen. And you know what the good news is? You're still safe in his hands. You're still safe in his love. That's not just for, in, just for this body only, but individually. If you're going through things where you're struggling and there's changes in your life, you can trust that God will get you through those things, as I learned. And you can trust that his plans, his eternal and sovereign will, hasn't altered or changed a bit. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which paths to take. Something that happens primarily to everyone's life, and that's a word that a lot of folks don't like to hear, and that is the word change. Change. When dealing with all aspects of life, change is inevitable. It's inevitable. Inevitable. Thought I would get that word right, but I didn't. In other words, it's unable to, you're unable to escape changes in life. Change is going to happen regardless. Changes can come in our family lives, marriages, jobs, and changes come in our church life as well. But there's one thing that I've learned in life, and that is that life does not always turn out the way that you think it should be. Let me tell you something. Nothing has turned out for me the way that I thought it was when I was younger. Absolutely nothing. I had no idea I'd be living in the valley. I had no idea I'd be standing up on a, on a pulpit preaching. I had no idea that any of this stuff was going to happen. In my mind, I had an entirely different plan for my life, but God had a different plan. And you know what? His plans are always way better than our plans. I certainly enjoy doing what I'm doing today than what I was doing back then. All my thoughts and things that I had and all the plans that I thought I had for my life, I would have been miserable now. I went to school to be a journalist. You know, I was expecting to be like, you know, Walter Conkrite or somebody. Some of you are too old to even know, too young to even know who that is. I shouldn't even have mentioned his name. But I went to school for journalism, and my, my, my desire was to become a journalist and maybe get on TV and you know, uh, you know, report the news and, and, and be all that, but that was not the plan that God had for my life. It was something that I had planned for my life, but not the plan that he had for my life. So, the good thing is that as long as God is at the helm of your life, as long as you trust him, and as long as you put your faith in him, he will always guide you in the way that you should go. Because unexpected changes and turns in our lives can sometimes send you into a loop. But throughout our time here on earth, and with the changes that take place around and with us, the most important thing that you have to ask yourself is, can you still trust God through those changes? 
Can you still believe that he's faithful to you when things don't go the way that you think they should go? When life doesn't go the way that you think it should go? When your job doesn't go the way that you think it should go? When your church doesn't go the way that you think it should go? Can you still reach out in your heart and still trust God to get you through whatever you're going through? Can you do that? Do we still account him as being faithful? Or do we lose hope? Remember, when trials come to your lives, it's to try your faith. That's your trust in God. And I'm telling you, in the hour that we're living in, there are a lot of folks whose faith are being tried. It's amazing to me to see people that were walking with God for 20 years, 30 years, just quit walking with the Lord. Why? What happened? What caused them to lose hope? What caused them to lose faith? In 1 Peter chapter 6, it says this, So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Church, the most precious thing that you will have and to hold on to is your faith or your trust in God. And there is nothing more that the devil would like to do than to get you to stumble in your faith. That's his objective. That's his aim. He doesn't want you to believe in God. He doesn't want you to believe in the word. He's doing all he can do to try to turn your heart away from the gospel. And that's why we've got to hold on to our trust in the Lord, especially when we go through trials and tribulations. Because when we go through trials and tribulations, and lots of times we like wonder, where, where is God during this trial? Where is he? He's right there with you. And if you'll hold on, he'll get you through. As Proverbs chapter 4 states, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Not everything that happens in our lives is going to be understandable. At first, there's some things that happen, and all we can do is kind of just shake your head. We definitely know that some things are demonic. There's no doubt about that. But everything isn't always that way. Sometimes life just happens. And we don't always have an answer. There's some things I don't always have an answer for. We may not have an answer for those things right away when they happen. God may eventually reveal to us what went down, but when these things do happen that we may not quite get, the Scripture in Proverbs says, further to seek his will, or as in some translations says, acknowledge him, and he will guide you and direct you in the way that you should go. You may not always understand right away what's going on, but trust him to lead you and guide you as you continue to pursue him because there's one thing that I have learned, folks, over the years, and that is that God always has your best interests in mind, no matter what. Always. I remember when I was working a particular job. Unfortunately, I didn't quite get along with the boss that well. And so a question came to me one time that asked me, uh, what did I think about the boss's supervisory skills? This was the boss that asked me that question. Being a native New Yorker who sometimes speaks his mind a little bit too much, I said, well, this is what I think. I think you can do better in this area, that area, and I don't think you do too well here. I said, I used to be a supervisor of a data center, so I know, I know what it's like to deal with people and do stuff like that. So here's where you can have some improvements, bum, 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 bum. Well, that didn't go too well with her. So the handwriting was on the wall from that day forward. And I got fired. 
Surprise, surprise. <laughs> it fired me. So truth of the matter is, I was kind of, when I walked out, I said, Lord, I thank you. I thank thee for delivering me from that place. <laughs> I was miserable. But I'll tell you what, I still trusted the Lord through the whole thing. And God was faithful, opened up other, another door, got a much better job. So I'm not saying that you should, you know, tell that to your, uh, your boss if you ever ask that question. But I did. Well, that was a change in my life, you know. I got, I got fired. I had never got fired before. But God was faithful. And as long as I held on to my trust in him, he opened up another door, which much better job, believe you me. So it's not about just trusting in the hand of man. I'm a strong believer in covenant relationships, and there's people that God brings into your life who we know we can fully trust, but ultimately we have to fully trust the Lord even if nothing makes sense. Believe that he will get us through the trials and the things that happen in our lives, even in our disappointments. You know what? The reality is that people may not always do what we expect them to do, but God is faithful all the time. He is the one that you can depend on all the time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24 says this, reading from the Amplified Bible, one of my favorite translations, says, faithful and absolutely trustworthy is he who is calling you to himself for salvation, and he will do it. He will fulfill his call by making you holy, guarding you, watching over you, and protecting you as his own. So one example of a man that trusted the Lord despite all that was thrown at him was Job. I'm convinced that God has the book of Job in the, in the canon of Scripture to encourage us all and to help us to learn how to remain consistent and to persevere no matter what we go through, and how to continue to hold on and to trust the Lord. In James chapter 5, verse 11, it says this, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And that word perseverance... Patience is translated in some Bibles. It's a Greek word, hupomene, means endurance, continuance, or patient endurance. What were some of the things that stood out with Job? I want to take a look at that. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. I'm just going to highlight two scriptures, but I'm going to read through it. In Job chapter 1, verse 1, there was once a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz, he was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 oxen, 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in the entire area. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes. And they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer burnt offerings for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular practice. One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord. I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. The Lord asked Satan, well, have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear you. You, you have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is, but reach out and take away everything that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. 
Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. And one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with the news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. And when the Sabines raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with the news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burnt up your sheep and all the shepherds. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, the third messenger arrived with the news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and your daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly, a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed, and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. And then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Verse 22 says this, In all this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Job chapter 2. One day the members of the heavenly court came again to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil, and he has maintained his integrity, even though you urge him or rather urged me to harm him without cause. And Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin, a man will give up everything he has to save his life. But reach out and take his health, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, do with him as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. So Satan left the Lord's presence, and he struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat amongst the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? And once again, so in all this, Job said nothing wrong. Some translations said that he did not sin with his lips. Imagine this. Here was a man that in a very short period of time lost his livelihood, lost his health, and lost his children. Man. And if you continue to read, he had some pretty useless friends. They were absolutely useless. And yet, despite all his losses, he still held on to his trust and his integrity in the Lord. Yet he suffered. I mean, he's scraping boils with a pot shirt in great anguish. He was in anguish. And as you read through the book of Job, he did air some complaints. He complained. He greatly expressed his emotions to the Lord, and he questioned God on some things. But he still held on to his trust in God. He never let it go, despite even complaining, despite even questioning God. He still held on to his integrity. And in the end, after God made some corrections and adjustments to his thinking, Job came out humbled, restored, and with a greater understanding and a knowing of who God really was. In Job chapter 42, it says in the Amplified Classic, it says, 
I heard of you only, I'd heard of you only by the hearing of the ear, but now my spiritual eyes see you. Something happened to Job. He had a greater revelation of his God. It said now his spiritual eyes was being able to see God, whereas before he had only heard about him by the hearing of the ear. Therefore, I loathe my words and abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So not only did Job come away with a greater revelation of the Lord and went on from head knowledge of God, went from being, having a head knowledge in God to a heart revelation, but it brought repentance into his life and God restored him fully. Fully. Look at what it says in Job chapter 42. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as he had before. Then all his brothers and sisters, former friends, came and feasted with him in his home, and they consoled him, comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against him. And each of them brought him a gift of money, of gold. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camel, 1,000 teams of oxen, Whew. female donkeys, all kinds of stuff. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. He named his first daughter Jemima, second Kezia, the third Karen Hapak. In all the land, no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job. And their father put them into his will along with their brothers. And Job lived to be 140 years after that. Imagine living to be 140 years old. Who'd like to live to be 140 years old? I'm not sure about that. Living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren, and then he died. An old man who had lived a long, full life. Now, we may not have it as extreme as Job had it, but my point here is that despite all that Job has been through, despite his losses, despite his disappointments, he never lost or wavered in his trust in the integrity of his God. And this is the question that each of us have to ask ourselves. It's something I have to ask myself when I go through a trial. Do I still believe that God is big enough to get me through this situation? And whatever it is I'm going through, am I holding on to God's integrity that things will work out? So my encouragement to you here this morning is despite the changes that may be going on amongst you, to continue to trust and the integrity of your God. God is no different toward this church or your individual lives before changes, and he's no different after. He is the same always, and his plan is always the same. You want to know why? Because you can lean on him because he is a rock. In Psalms chapter 18, verse 2, it says this, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my keen and firm strength. That could also be translated as rock. In whom I will trust and take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. You know, a rock is unmovable. Knowing that he is our rock, knowing that he's your rock, that's a stabilizer for when you go through trials, and we all do. The other thing that's good about knowing that he's your rock is that you will not be a slave to your emotions. You know, a lot of folks make emotional decisions. I've seen folks, when a church goes through a trial, they don't pray about it, they don't talk to God, they don't refer to the Holy Spirit, they just give in to their emotions and they just go. Meantime, the Holy Spirit may not have told them to go. And I've seen some of these same folks that they're still, still searching for their place, still looking, and they can't seem to find their place because of an emotional decision. And when you know that Jesus Christ, when you know that God is your rock, that is a great stabilizer for you. When you have that revelation, you will not be subject to your emotions. Now, I'm not saying that we cannot be emotional. 
There's nothing wrong with expressing your emotions at all. But our emotions were given primarily to express toward God. And there's times, to be honest, and you know this to be true, that with God and with one another, we need to express our emotions. Hey, Job expressed his emotions to God as well. But your emotions don't have to rule you. You can let the Spirit of God and the Word of God rule you. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 and 4 says, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you and all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. Keep your eyes on Jesus no matter what. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 3 Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Disregarding its shame, now he is seated in a place of honor besides God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. I want to encourage you also to pursue the high and heavenly calling during this season. According to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 and 14, Paul said it like this. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And there's also something else, something that we went through at Broadway Church some years ago and that we had to learn. Allow yourself time to heal and make some adjustments. Like it says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to heal, a time to grieve, and a time to mourn. But you know what else comes? There's going to come a time to laugh and also a time to dance. Psalms 147 and 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Disappointments and wounds don't always heal overnight. Sometimes it takes a while. And I don't believe this thing that that says that time heals. No, God heals. So allow God to work in your hearts. There's nothing wrong with expressing frustration, disappointments. Nothing wrong with expressing your emotions, but let God be the primary one to hear you out because he's your healer. You know, oftentimes when I'm frustrated with something or I'm feeling emotional, you know, I have people I can talk to. I can talk to my wife all the time. But primarily, I just get alone with the Lord. And I just just release it. I have scripture to, to prove that. In Psalms 142, 1 and 2, it says, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. So, there's times when I've got things I'm going through, maybe I don't want to talk to anybody about it. I know primarily the one to talk to is the Lord. and So I'll just get along with him and just, and you know what? When I come out, I feel like a weight's been lifted off of me. You could do that with folks too. There's some trusted friends that you have. I believe we should talk to one another, and I believe we should have those kind of relationships. But the primary person that we should be going to when it comes to frustrations, when it comes to disappointments, when it comes to hurts, when it comes to times when we need to be healed, we need to go get alone in that closet, get alone with the Lord. I'm telling you, I have gotten up off my knees or however I was praying, and I've actually felt like my heart felt clean. I felt like there were weights that were lifted off me. I just got it out. I had to get it out. And some things you just got to get out. Some frustrations you just got to get out. It is your unwavering 
trust and faith in God that will get you through any circumstance. Psalms chapter 91 says this, He who dwells in a secret place of the Most High will remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and on Him I will lean on and rely, and in Him I will confidently, everybody say trust. Psalm 56 and 3. It says, what time I am afraid, I will have confidence in and put my trust and reliance in you. By the help of God, I will praise his word. On God I lean, rely, and confidently put my trust. I will not fear what man can do. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Listen to what it says. The leaning of your entire human personality on him in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, and the love which you have and show for all the saints, God's consecrated ones. In Romans chapter 28, the Amplified Bible says, and we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned, deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good. For those who love God and to those who are the called according to his plan and purpose. And so, CCA, church, I finish with Jeremiah 29, 11. And it says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. God's plans for this church has not changed. It's the same. It has not altered. And God still loves you the same as he did before things happened, and he will continue to love you as we continue to move forward. So, in closing, I just want to pray for you. So let's pray.